Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online book talk for the first, uh, The Inside Story of Women Reshaping Congress. I am Betsy Fisher Martin, and I'm the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And on behalf of my co moderator, Susanna Welford, uh, the CEO and founder of Running Start, we are so glad that you are able to join us uh, for this uh, special discussion. We want to uh, thank Jennifer Steinhauer of the New York Times, uh, our new author here tonight, and Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger for joining us as well. I want to give you a brief overview of our format this evening in our brand new virtual world that we have going on. Um, in just a moment, I will have Susanna introduce our two guests, and then Jennifer will spend a few minutes or so talking about the broad themes in her book uh, about women in Congress, and then she'll bring Congresswoman Spanberger into this discussion. And we may have a little bit of a turn the tables there at the end. So uh, she may get to ask Jennifer a question or two. And then we will take some student questions from students uh, in a class that Susanna is teaching for us at American mm -hmm. University called Women in Political Leadership. So she has some student questions that we'll ask. And then we will save plenty of time to take questions from you in the audience. Uh, for those of you not already familiar with Crowdcast as a platform, I want to let you know that on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a prompt that says, ask a question. Uh, and that is where you could submit a question. Um, please go ahead and start submitting those. And if you see a question that's of interest to you, you can upvote the question. So we'll try to make sure to get to as many uh, questions that most people want to hear uh, the answer to as we go along. Um, also on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a uh, button there to purchase a copy of the first if you're interested in doing so. And a few minutes after the event, uh, you'll be able to rewatch the entire thing. So if you need to leave in the middle, you can come back uh, and rewatch it at the same the same exact link that you use to log in. So with that, let me turn it over to Susanna Welford of Running Start, who's going to do a brief introduction of our guests, and we will get the show started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. So I am so happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm Susanna Welford, the CEO and founder of Running Start. And if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit that trains young women to run for political office. And we've been around since 2007, and we've trained 17,000 500 young women who all really want to be Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger because we're trying to we're trying to role model. So I want to introduce you to our wonderful speakers that we have tonight. The first one, the Congresswoman, Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger is um, represents the Virginia's seventh congressional district and she was elected in 2018. She is a very unusual Congresswoman because prior to serving in Congress, she was an undercover operative for the CIA. She was moved to join the CIA after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, where she felt that she had to serve her country. And she says this was a turning point in her life. And she told ABC News that for the majority of the time when she was working with the agency, even her own mother didn't know what she did for a living. <laughs> the Congresswoman also worked in the private sector to help colleges and universities diversify their student bodies and increase graduation, graduation rates. She currently serves on the Agriculture and Foreign Affairs Committees in the House of Representatives. She grew up in Henrico County, Virginia, and earned her BA at the University of Virginia, which is great because I went there too. And she got her MBA at a dual degree program between Purdue University and the GISMA Business School in Hanover, Germany. She currently resides in Glen Allen with her husband, Adam, and her three children. So welcome, Congresswoman. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, and next we have Jennifer Steinhauer. Jennifer has been a reporter with the New York Times since 1994. She's worked on the Metro Business and National Desk and served as City Hall Bureau Chief and Los Angeles Bureau Chief before she moved to DC in 2010. She's the author of a novel, two cookbooks, and the book that we're here to discuss tonight, the first, um, which is the story of the women of the 116th Congress. So I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy of this book, and it quickly became one of my favorites. It is unbelievably dog-eared. I don't know if you all can see. <laughs> and I love it because she is a really wonderful storyteller, and she lets the readers get into the minds of these women who ran for Congress. Um, and she talks about their race, but she also talks about what it's like to serve in Congress as a woman. And many of these are also very young women. 
And in case you were wondering um, whether she just does politics and, um, and what these cookbooks are all about, I found out they are the perfect COVID cookbooks because they teach you how to create the snacks that you all loved as kids, like Oreos, et cetera. And she wrote a cookbook on meatloaf and how to make great meatloaf. So um, <laughs> so anyway, I think that, that is, that's fascinating. I can't wait to check those out. So thank you both so much for being here. And I will pass the mic over to Jen. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy, so much for putting this together. It's so um, great to be here in AU Park where I live. I'm only I'm only feet away from the university. Um, it's sad to not be able to go to bookstores and to come live to classrooms and talk to people right now. But at the same time, being able to use this um, this format, this platform allows us all to be together in, in ways in a larger group um, sometimes. So it's nice to connect with everybody, even though I can't see all your lovely faces and all your hair that I'm sure needs cutting. Um, <laughs> uh, like mine, it's great to, to see it, to, to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about um, what I care a lot about, which is uh, women in power and women in politics. And I, I, I assume most of our audience is also deeply interested in this topic, um, which is a little bit a jumping off point to talk about how the book came to be. Um, shortly after the 2018 election, an editor from Algonquin Betsy Lee called me and she said, I'm really fascinated with all these women who have run. First of all, you have all these first, uh, we know that the first um, Muslim um, women to serve in Congress, well, the first Native American women. We have a lot of, uh, with the youngest and the oldest female, by the way, Donna Shalala, uh, to serve as a house freshman who'd been a cabinet member and, and, and running university. We forget about that sometimes. We have the oldest and the youngest, lots of people who were um, the first woman, the first person of color, the youngest person in their district to win, sometimes in a combination of, of those things. So um, it, it was that, and it was also women with, to me, what was equally interesting are the varied professional backgrounds that people were bringing, especially these women um, of which uh, Congresswoman Spanberger is part of, a group of national security and veteran women uh, that we'll return to because that was also a topic of interest to me. So I was I was very interested in this, obviously the, the notion of all these firsts, the notion of being, even though it's not 25% of Congress yet, having the greatest number of women in Congress and what that was going to, to mean. Um, and so the other thing that interested me though about their story politically was that um, as I mentioned, I started, I moved to Washington in 2010 and that was in the height of the Tea Party uh, revolution. And um, one piece of that, as you all know, didn't come that year, but later was when uh, Dave Bratt, who's the, uh, the Republican that uh, Congressman Spammer ultimately unseated, uh, he was kind of part of that whole movement that, that undid the leadership of, of the Republicans that were uh, in power at that time. But to see these 87 freshmen come in, you know, fresh off this Tea Party wave, a lot of them citizen lawmakers, uh, was very interesting to me. It was a question of, of what they were going to do um, and what, what they would change uh, once they got here. And I would uh, argue they changed quite a bit, actually. Um, and what that finally culminated in, that movement, culminated, I believe, in the election of Donald Trump. That became a trajectory where the populism um, underlying all of that and the reaction to uh, the Obama administration uh, brought out into open all these different uh, political dynamics that, that became that. And then you go to, and I think we can all pretty much agree that um, Trumpism, as it were, has, has totally taken over, at least for now, the Republican Party. So then you go to 2018, and you're kind of bookending 2010, in my mind, with this election of this new freshman led by women, most of whom, which is this part of the story really kind of gets lost sometimes among the more high profile women in the beginning, at least, who beat Republicans in districts that were, um, uh, you know, a lot more, somewhat more, sometimes very much more uh, Republican than Democrat uh, voters. And they were basically running and elected in response to the 2016 election. It was a, it was a referendum, if you will, on that. So if you go from that Tea Party movement to where we are, led by women, which the Tea Party movement certainly had female members who came in at that time, but that was not a female movement. You're really seeing to me a really important um, and interesting uh, arc in contemporary political history. So of course, I, my question for these freshmen and especially the women was the same as it was for those, um, those folks who were elected in 2010, which is, Will they change Washington or will Washington change them? And that's something that I want to um, explore. I tried to explore in the book and I'd like to talk more about um, tonight. 
The other thing I think is interesting when we talk about um, a trajectory is that um, in 2018, yes, Trump won the ballot in a sense, but in a lot of these districts, and particularly the Republican districts, people running didn't want to talk about him so much. They you know, they wanted to talk about issues, particularly health care, because at the time Republicans had been attacking the Affordable Care Act, and that was animating a lot of these campaigns. And a lot of people say to me now, well, that health care, that's out the window, and, and they were going to run on drug prices this year, and that was going to be part of their whole message. Um, and it was going to be a referendum on Trump for sure. And now it's all about about uh, the COVID period and how and what's happened, which I agree with. But I think that that's an outgrowth of both those issues. There's there's no issue in contemporary life. The passage of the Affordable Care Act doesn't even come close. And that was seismic. That's going to shine the light on um, the issues with our health care system in the aftermath of COVID. Right now we're in an emergency and we're dealing with that. But when when the bills for this start to come and then we see the, the impact on people's health, the long term impact on our health care system and the insurance issues that come out of this, I think health care will remain very much part of this conversation. And obviously Donald Trump's handling of it, which I presume will also be um, a, par a huge part of the discussion, not just in the race for the White House, but for people running for the House and the Senate again. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, before uh, we move on is that um, I get asked a lot about, you know, the different uh, factions in this House and what it might portend about for the 2020 race. And I think it, a, a lot. I think, um, you know, there was a group of women who came in uh, who got a lot of attention for unseating Democrats. And as I said, um, equally important and frankly more so in the sense that they're the ones who handed the gavel back to Nancy Pelosi are the Democrats who beat Republicans. And as soon as everyone landed in Washington, you started, in my view, to see a lot of the tensions uh, between these two ends of the party. And moderate's a word I like to not use so much because it's kind of too broad a brush, but sort of the very progressive. Um, People who are representing that part end of the party and are probably the future, frankly, um, of that segment of the party. Uh, I would argue that uh, Andrew Ocasio Cortez is probably the titular leader in some sense of the not in, in any way in, in legislatively, but in the politics and the left in the far left politics. I think she's kind of replaced Bernie as he's will kind of bow out of the scene, and she will probably be that person. And then the more moderate wing of the party. Um, who had districts to think about and voting records to think about to, to, so they could stay in Congress. I think a lot of those tensions that you saw, what is who owns the party? What's the heart and soul of the party? What's the trajectory of the party? How do you stay powerful and meaningful as a party um, and, and stay in power? I think we saw that all play out a lot in the 116th Congress, and that was kind of a precursor to what you're seeing in the race for the White House and the Democratic Party. And, um, a lot of times people ask me, how did Nancy Pelosi deal with all this, uh, this different factions? And I think you know, she spent a long time in Congress learning how to manage all different elements um, um, as you know, the most powerful woman in Washington, uh, uh, her entire career um, in dealing with a very diverse caucus. And I think what was interesting to her was what could be challenging for her was trying to manage these conflicts and to keep them from being personal and to make sure that women in particular who had a lot of political power leveraged that into legislative power um, and to be a force for good. And that was the kind of the struggle that I felt I was observing from the sidelines. And it was very much from the sidelines. I'm obviously not a member of Congress. I'm not a staffer. I wasn't in all of, of, of every one of those meetings. I had to kind of get the reports afterwards. But fortunately for congressional reporters, you can kind of you have uh, you have members accessible to you as Congresswoman Spamberger, I'm sure, learned with some great displeasure, along with other freshman colleagues, of how much reporters hang around and how much they're able to find you and have access to you and to really spend time with folks. And back in the district, too, I tried to get to as much as I could to observe these women um, in and out of Washington as they evolved into these roles. And, you know, the other thing I would say before um, we, I I uh, had the opportunity to talk to Congressman Spanberger about some of these issues is that we know a lot about the squad. You saw a lot about them, um, the so-called squad, the the uh, four women um, who largely represent represent safe Democratic districts with pretty progressive views. AOC, we've talked about Ilhan Omar from Minnesota, where she did to leave from the Detroit area, and Ayanna Presley from Boston, although I kind of put her a little bit in a different category. She separates from them a little bit. 
But in, in my mind, I kind of concluded um, at the end of the book that the real squad was really more of the national security women. They, they knew each other um, and campaigned a lot together before uh, 2018, which was not the case with the other women. They didn't really know each other that well until they got to Washington. They um, spent a lot of time, as I could see, uh, it, as a group. I see them a lot together on the Hill. I know they were part with other veterans and male veterans, too, of, of a group text. They talked a lot. They seemed to consult more on legislation and, and voted in a lot of ways more often together. Um, and to me, uh, that's in some ways was more of an authentic, uh, cohesive squad, especially uh, as it presented to the rest of the country and that played out against impeachment and their decision to write not bed for the Washington Post, many of them to um, to advocate for something that frankly, they and many Democrats in the House had been resistant to for a long time and, and history will show us, I guess, uh, the wisdom and the merits of that choice. So with that, I would love to come back to the Congresswoman and uh, bring her back to our, our discussion and ask her a few questions um, about some of these theories that I've just presented. I'd love to hear <laughs> response or thoughts you have to them. But um, I wanted to start with you in the present. This is such a weird time. When you guys came into office, there was a government shutdown. Yep. And so that was super weird and not normal at all, not the way you picture starting your term. And now we're in this other unprecedented situation um, where, you know, Congress is trying to one of the least flexible institutions to work remotely. You're obviously, I'm sure, dealing hourly with the needs and problems of your uh, constituents in central Virginia. You have to deal with this, the federal issues, massive, unbelievable, uh, large scale legislation like we haven't seen even uh, in 2008. We thought that was huge. And um, you're also a mom. And you're probably having to watch some homeschooling and, and dealing with the, the life that we all are leaving. Congresswomen, they're just like us, you know, <laughs> with, all these, with all these kids at home and everything and, and, and trying to manage your family life. So you're like us, you're not like us. So what, what's that been like and, and how do you kind of put that in context of your term that you've served so far? Well, Jennifer, it's it's been interesting because you mentioned we started under a government shutdown and then we had all of the will they impeach, won't they impeach, then we did impeach. Then just when it felt like we were moving into 2020 and this was going to be maybe a relatively normal year, then we had the real amping up of tensions with Iran. Uh, and I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and, and certainly as a former CIA officer, that was front and center of my attention for quite some time. And then COVID-19, and, and I've been focused on COVID-19 since early February I, on foreign affairs. Our subcommittee uh, has been focused. We had hearings the first week in February. Uh, we've been really active on, at first it was recognizing what was happening in Asia and how can we ourselves prepare back home. Um, and now we've moved into a full on position where we are responding. Um, and in our district, we now have 45 uh, deaths at a nursing home, a rehabilitation facility in our district. Um, and so we are hard hit, um, different from the kind of overload on the hospitals that New York uh, and New Jersey are experiencing, but you know, the tragedy is great. And so we're, we've pivoted completely, you know, where I was working on various different pieces of legislation focused on you know, needs of my constituents and foreign affairs priorities and broadband internet, which is a big issue for my district. Um, now my team is repatriating Americans back to this country, back home, uh, trying to get people off of cruise ships, which were past that successfully have done it. Uh, you know, I am, I feel like I've become pen pals with the small business administration trying to pound on issues related to the payment protection plan and some shortcomings in that plan as it relates to the rules they put on it. Uh, um, and so it's, you know, it's, it is surreal to be where we are. Um, and then, you know, I'm a parent, I have three s relatively small kids. I've got a kindergartner, a third grader and a sixth grader who are all homeschooling. Um, and I am going to use the air quotes because, um, you know, I have nothing but tremendous respect for, uh, for our educators and, um, you know, we're, we're trying, I'm on the call, I'm on calls nonstop. Um, you know, and, and this, I'm happy to be talking to you. It's, it's a little bit of fun in an otherwise really hard time. Um, so it's, it's just, it's been a flurry, but you know what, it's been a flurry since 2017. Right. 
but now, but now there's real anguish and real heartache. And that's, you know, as a representative, that's the really personal piece is when there are people around you who you represent who are just um, suffering and, and trying to make ends meet and worried about the business that they built that was their dream that now may go under because of a public health crisis. And so, um, you know, trying to be present when you can't be present um, is it's been a really interesting aspect of this crisis. You know, I don't like to gender everything. I really don't. But as I'm listening to you speak, do you think there's anything um, that you feel yourself or you feel maybe coming from these constituents and these folks, folks that you're uh, working with in this bizarre situation? Do you think there's anything about being a woman that makes that different uh, than it might be if you had a male in that job? Um, you know, I think that the element of kind of how I've chosen based on who I am as a person, but then how I, I function as a representative, um, I, I, I've been very focused on what the needs of people are and, and the needs is more, the needs represent a lot more than just, you know, I want this, I need this forgivable loan for my small business. For me, you know, I have asked, well, what is the small business and what is it like and what does it need? Um, you know, one of the things that um, I have, we now have on our website, you know, we, we get emails and calls of people who need set things. But I told my team, I said, I, I need to hear their stories in addition to be, of course, we want to answer questions and this, provide assistance. But there are people who don't necessarily reach out because they need something. But I want to give a venue to hear their stories because there's heartbreak across our community and, and I need to hear it and I need to feel it and I need to know what is fueling me. Um, and, you know, the, the stories are just, they're really hard and people are suffering. And, and I, so I do think, I don't know if it's gendered, but I, I think it's a, in, there's an earnestness that I guess exists if you're trying to really understand um, and empathize with someone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I guess there's when you are not people's perception of what a particular role is, you get to in, invent it in a way. And so, you know, even on the campaign trail, that was one of the things is my district. I'm the first woman to ever represent my district. Um, and so, you know, people didn't have they couldn't fill in the blanks. You know, if you think, oh, this congressman, like you, you might give a couple things and you can fill it out, right? My district, uh, the congressperson is a man, a white man of a general certain age and, and a Republican, at least for the last 50 years. Um, and so there was a there was a bit of a freedom for me that once people realize, well, she's a, she's Democrat and she's a woman and she's you know got these kids and she was CIA, like you've just sort of exploded it all. So they can't fill in the puzzle pieces. And then that's a, that's a presents a bit of freedom for you to be able, or at least for me to be able to just walk into a space and, you know, I guess oh, I'm sure. who I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about, uh, I mean, CIA, CIA operative is not your typical background for a member of Congress, um, especially for women. Is there anything about that that you think has been particularly helpful um, in your role in Congress and perhaps even in this very specific moment that we're living in? I think so. So my role as a, I was a case officer, I worked undercover. Um, I would go out and recruit foreign nationals to commit espionage on behalf of the United States government and provide information. So then I would go and I would meet people in you know, strange locations and debrief them and send all this information back to Washington that would get rolled up by analysts into the presidential daily brief, right? That's the end goal. Not everything made it to the PDB, but that's the, the general framework. Um, and so it was a variety of things. One, you have to be good under pressure. You have to adjust well to pressure. You have to, um, I guess, in some cases, thrive um, in a in what might be a more stressful circumstance for people. Um, you have to try and put pieces together constantly and consistently. Um, you have to ask a whole lot of questions because you ha you have to understand something. So if I was reporting on a particular topic, um, uh, let's say meatloaf recipes, just for the purposes of, you know, being fully away from the Intel community, you know, okay, well, why did you get interested in meatloaf recipes? What do you know about meatloaf recipes? Um, what are some of the ways that you can substitute? Like, let's say new, 
let's say meatloaf recipes are like akin to nuclear uh, production. Like, what do you need to substitute if you don't have meat that you might use? What and you know how far along is she in making her meatloaf recipes and in the production of her meatloaf? So, um, looking at a whole host of information and basically seeing where are their holes. For me, that equates to I used to be answering questions so that we would know what was happening in the world. Now it's what else do I need to know to be able to address this issue? Or, you know, you also are really earnest about things that aren't working. So, you know, I, I'm talking to constituents and they're saying, I'm really excited about this payment protection plan process, but you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily need to hear the niceties. I want to hear the but because the but is what I can address. Right. right. Um, and and then I think that you to be a good CIA officer, you gotta have a significant level of curiosity because you're you're constantly dealing with people who have vastly different backgrounds. And so in Congress or in my district, you know, I represent a lot of people who fall across the spectrum that's probably, you know, this big. Um, and so to be able to connect, even if it's just about one little thing, is is important. And then the same goes for working with my colleagues. You know, there's a lot of people in Congress that I disagree with on a whole host of things, but can I find that one commonality to try and work together? Um, and that I, I think all of that is uh, are, are skills that I I had to utilize as a CIA officer. So you're um, in a group of women that I alluded to. I think you guys all called yourself the badasses um, of women who are from the military or national security space. Yeah. And then there's some guys that got elected with you who come from that same background. And I've kind of um, been curious to know for you um, as having and people, you know, you do need, it's like high school, you need friends yeah. when you're in Congress, you gotta have some buddies. So what's been more meaningful for you and more helpful and just more important to you um, being with what is, you know, again, small, but a large number of women, you know, relative to Congress history, to being part of a large class of women or being part of this group of folks, mostly women, but also men in the who come from this national security and veteran space. Well, so I think they're both really important, but they they focus on different things. So our freshman class is incredibly diverse and big and kind of boisterous. And we have, uh, you know, Kim Schreier, who was a, the first pediatrician. The, uh, she's the only woman physician in Congress. She's the, uh, the only pediatrician in Congress. And for her, you know, her story of how she got to Congress is, uh, is really cool. Here she's seeing attacks on healthcare. She's a physician. She has patients. And I'm oversimplifying her story. Um, and so she ran for Congress. We have Johanna Hayes from Connecticut who's a former teacher of the year, like literally the teacher of the year. So when we're talking about what's going well or what's a challenge in education, like who better to have than a former teacher of the year? We've got Dean Phillips from Minnesota, uh, who uh, you know was the founder of uh, a vodka company and then he does uh, Talenti Gelato, like just an interesting background. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And I could probably, you know, run through everybody. Sean Caston from Illinois, who uh, was a renewable energy CEO and like brings a really interesting perspective, you know. And so you have this whole big, broad group that brings a certain strength to Congress. And it is it is fun to be in a room and hear the questions that they ask. And Donna Shalala, you mentioned, who likes to say, I may be a freshman, but I'm not a newbie, you know, because she elected to Congress in her 70s. She's the former secretary of Health and Human Services. So, you know, we do we call her secretary? Do we call her congresswoman? Um, and, uh, and and so th there's that element, which is exciting, um, to have these incredible people as colleagues and as friends. And then there's the fact that I did find this smaller niche of people whose, uh, whose motivation to run really is driven by a, a very finite, um, similar rationale, which is, um, we had all served in various different ways in nonpartisan roles. You know, I'd, I've always loved politics, but I was not really engaged in politics. I was under the Hatch Act. You can only be but so political. So, you know, I don't think I even had a bumper sticker. I think my husband had a bumper sticker on his car and that felt, you know, about as political as I felt publicly appropriate being. Um, and I left CIA in, in 2014. I wanted to move back home um, and, and, and shift my career, I thought that my time of service had had ended. Um, and then after 2016, 
I, I felt a significant desire to get back uh, involved. And that's a commonality that for my friends, it's the same circumstance, at least in that little group where we had all served in various different ways, had moved on into what was seemingly the next phase in our life. And then when, when we viewed what was an emergency circumstance um, and a continued challenge to all that we have served and the norms that we abided, um, we decided to run. Um, I, I think that we also share you know, a, a general perspective focused on how do you solve problems? How do you help people? How do you do the right thing? Um, how do you, how do you lead by bringing people together? Um, and so, you know, our, our friendship is, and we just really enjoy each other as well. Um, and we also like to keep, you know, meetings on time and things efficient. So there's certain backgrounds that come from military and uh, the Intel world that, I mean, if there's one place where I don't think people know how to tell time, it is certainly Congress, if I might be. Um, but you've seen that, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I, I they're a group that, and you mentioned, like, we coordinate on legislation nonstop, and we bounce ideas off each other nonstop. Um, and that's, that's a, a really good um, touchstone to have in, in a busy, chaotic place like Congress. And, you know, freshmen historically don't have much power, um, even when in a majority. This class, I would argue, does because of your size and the um, vast professional backgrounds that you mentioned. So how do you kind of define power for yourself in this role? I think it has to be about, it has to be focused on the constituents. For for me, I ran saying I was going to represent my district um, and, and focus on the needs of my district. But what's, I think, important about my district, and of course I'm biased because it's my district, is uh, it's 10 counties. Uh, I don't know that we are gerrymandered, but we are the result of everyone else's gerrymander. So we've got suburban communities and rural communities and, and a real mix. Um, and so essentially in my district, just about any issue that might be important someplace else is also an issue in my district. So I, I in kind of defining power, I have found links to a lot of the issues that people want to talk about, I can bring them back home to my district. I can talk about those issues in the, in the way that I talk about things in my district. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much singularly focused on helping my district and by extension and by results, helping the country and moving things forward. And I, I think that we as a nation need to put a focus on putting like a heart back in politics and mm -hmm. endeavoring to recognize that there's a place for the federal government to help create a path for people to have better, stronger lives. Um, and and uh, that's that's how it, I drive things. And I think, you know, people don't like surprises. So, you know, if I'm going to vote for something, I'm going to vote for something. If I'm not, I'm not. Um, and I, I try to build really broad consensus um, with people, you know, as I mentioned before, that I, I may not always agree with, but find that commonality, you know, and, and authorization of use of military power is one that I'm really very passionate about. That is Congress's authority. And under any president who oversteps that, that's a problem. Um, but certainly in just in 2020, we've seen real significant infringements um, by this administration. And so, you know, it, as it happens, there's Quite a few Democrats who are want to have the AUMF conversation when there's a Republican in in the White House, um, and when you get to Republicans who care very deeply about constitutionality issues, you sometimes have to go towards the Tea Party folks. And so I actually um, I got together with Chip Roy, who is a Tea Party member from Texas, and we don't we joke all the time we don't agree on a lot, but we agree on the fact that the debt is bad and Congress has to authorize you know military use. Um, and that our AUMFs need to be um, uh, reauthorized. And so we got together, started writing an op-ed, and we pulled in uh, two more Democrats, two more Republicans, and then Justin Amash, who's Congress's only independent on the House side, and wrote an op-ed. And so I, you know, I, I like to find places where you can prove that there is a bit of commonality of idea. Um, and that's power, too, to build coalitions. Coalitions are powerful as well. Yeah. Well, I, um, I see a lot of audience questions, and I always like to make sure other people get a chance to ask questions, but before we do that, um, since you were so nice to me to let me sit in your office and bother you and chase you down hallways and torture you and harass you for well over a year, 
I was going to give you one opportunity to turn the tables on me and see if you had any question for me before we go to our lovely audience. Okay, so I I was actually going to ask you a cooking question when I observed in the background you've got the Silver Spoon cookbook uh, because I actually have the same cookbook. And then I learned about the meatloaf recipe cookbook and you're blowing my mind. So I would ask this question and then if you'll give me an extra, I might do an extra one. Um, what, how do you think that your, um, that your love of cooking and potentially recipe writing even um, is, influenced uh, or has influenced your work and your understanding of politics? Oh, that's funny. Well, my meatloaf cookbook, I did get four um, members of Congress meatloafs and I made sure it was bipartisan, two of each. <laughs> um, and it was kind of funny because that was the one time everyone was like happy to hear from me. <laughs> so it was so limited. Um, you know, it's funny. I mean, I like to I write a lot about food and I do try to incorporate it with my political coverage because, you know, people go out like you guys do and you have your meetings. And I, I love to know, why did you pick that restaurant? Why did why did why is this this weird kind of hole in the wall Chinese restaurant that the Democrats like to go to? Fiola de Mar, which is this very fancy restaurant that does a lot of fundraisers, and everybody assumed it was Democrats. And I dug into it and I realized no, it's actually Republicans that are fueling all this fancy food out there. Not and and so and who and I and kind of like high end, you know, very gourmet food. So I like to I think it's a little bit of a window into people. I mean, I, and people that. It kind of changes your perception of them in terms of what they like to eat and drink. So I think they, they work well together as a topic. Okay, my here's my one, I'm gonna steal one more question. At the end of the day, you've been running around Capitol Hill all day long, you know, we're hiding from you in staircases and things like that. Yeah. Um, I'm, not that that has ever happened, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> long, long day, you go home, you have 10 minutes to make something to eat for a very late night dinner, what is it? Ten minutes. Oh well, I'm gonna make pasta. I'm gonna make um papi cacio check pepe cacio a pepe, which is just like a linguine or spaghetti, and then I use a little bit of the pasta water and lots of Parmesan cheese and lots of black pepper, um, and like the thickest noodles you have. You know, if, it's not really the best with linguine. It's more like with the bucatelli or something like a thicker noodle, and that's ten minutes. And everybody in my house loves that. They actually ask for that even when I have more time. So ah. you don't even need a recipe, but I'll send you one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, who are we gonna turn this over to, ladies? Um, okay, so um, I am teaching this wonderful class at AU this semester on women in political leadership. We spent the entire semester talking about women in politics at one of the most exciting points for women in politics in history, in, in my opinion. And so I have some questions that the class has, has submitted for both of you. The first one is for the Congresswoman from Saskia Moore. And she wants to know what advice do you have for young women who are thinking about running today? And I wanna add on, and how, how would you convince a young woman that, that politics is a good thing to go into? Well, I would say a couple things. I'll address your question first. Um, politics is in everything. And so I had said in the intro that I, you know, I hadn't been in politics because I was um, under the Hatch Act, but indeed everything from like how much your gas costs mm -hmm. to you know what your local taxes are to what you know your kids school day looks like everything is political um and so i would say everything is political and if you spend time uh you know in public parks and you care about the environment and you care about you know all of these other issues that we see as non-political indeed they're they're wholly political everything's political um so recognizing that i I think politics, as it's termed, doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be, oops, knocking this, it doesn't have to be bad. Um, and it is what you make it. And part of what I wanted to do when I ran is I didn't like the fact that it's all this, it seems like this like full body sport um, and where it's just like mud slinging. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to be the type of candidate that I want to vote for. I'm going to be the type of candidate and I'm going to talk about what I am for. Um, I'm going to be the type of, I'm going to do the sorts of things that I wish candidates would do down to when we did all of our phone banking and canvassing, we planned all of our canvas events weeks in advance and we created like Google sheets so people could sign up because I hated it when, you know, no offense to the, the younger folks. I hated it when someone who would, you know, who was a wonderful volunteer would call me 
um, from a campaign and say, can you canvas Saturday morning? And it's like Friday afternoon. And I would say, no, I have three kids and I have a job and I have this and I have that. I, I, I haven't planned for this. But the, what do you have three weeks from now? And they would say ah, nothing. Um, so I'm diverting down a path, but let me get back to Saskia's answer. Um, it would be do the things that um, that drive you, do the things that excite you. I think that some of the strongest members of Congress are people who um, didn't always want to go into politics. And that's, you know, there are many strong members who always knew they wanted to enter into politics. So that's not to the exclusion of that. But there's no perfect path. And if any group of, of, of any Congress shows that it's the 116th, that we have all of these members who are standing up for their communities, who have backgrounds as varied as I mentioned before, uh, who are bringing a lot to the table. And so there's no perfect path to get into a political career. And I would also say that what you think right now uh, might be the right path for you, you know, pursue it. But also be open to the fact that you know your path might wind and it might change, and like there's a real richness in that experience. But when you are ready to run for office, regardless of what office it is—if it's Congress, if it's school board, if it's Senate, if it's you know state delegate—be um, fearless about it. And when people doubt you, then that should fuel you to prove them wrong. Um, and it's amazing you know, that process where all it takes is a person at a time to bring over to the coalition that ultimately it will take for you to win. Um, so you need to demonstrate the belief in yourself and your capacity that you want others to have in you uh, because that's where they will get it from um, and be fearless in pursuit of what you think is right and what you think is good. Uh, and don't let anyone tell you how you should be uh, because people will ultimately want to vote for you if they can believe you. Um, yeah. And you have to be you have to be doing driven by the right reasons and authentic to yourself and fearless. Oh, that's so good. OK, that that is perfect. Um, I can't wait to um, to show that video clip to the young, young women at Running Start to convince them. So then uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn to you um, and. So the Congresswoman was talking about how, you know, there's a path for everybody and you should run on what you believe in. Um, Amanda Carter from my class writes, why do you think we're not seeing the same numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, of Republican women running and winning office as we are Democratic women? So um, I have a, long, a chapter in my book about Republican women. And the reason that I do it is because I wanted to explore why um, I thought why I thought they didn't win uh, in, in the year that women increased the most in Congress. And I realized that this was a situation that um, had been 10 years in the making, that Republican women have really lost a lot of ground uh, in Congress and in state houses and all over the place. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And if you look back at the history of Congress, um, the first woman in Congress, Jeanette Rankin, who was a suffragist, was a Republican. And for all those years in the beginning when there was just a handful of women, one, two, three at a time, you know, there were sometimes it was Republicans, sometimes it was Democrat. Um, it wasn't really until like the 60s and 70s where Democrats started to be more uh, more the number of women as the women increased, generally speaking. And Republican and Democratic women had the Women's Coalition. They had to really work together um, on a lot of things because none of them had any power. And so um, what happened is um, as Republicans in the Gingrich uh, era, the women, people who were coming in were more conservative and it was harder and harder as the party moved more to the right for women to win primaries. Because as you know, um, Susanna, you know this, that women, when they get through primaries, they win at the same rate as men in general elections. But Republicans, when women have a lot, hard time in primaries, and it's also true that, it's, that while Republican Party was very invested in electing women at one point, um, they kind of moved philosophically to believing we don't try to uh, promote a certain you know, agenda, we just want the best person to win. Well, you know, Democrats have very um, intentionally and studiously tried to lift up women um, and have fundraising mechanisms to do that. They've been focused on that. And I think in 2018 was a real lesson for Republican women. They want more women in Congress. And they started to realize that they were going to have to take those cues from Democrats if they want to win. There's a lot more women Republicans running this year. I bet you, I would bet that you'll see some more of them, some increase possibly in 2020, um, depending on uh, other factors. 
but it's only because of those intentional efforts. You know, it, it's actually, it does, it's a process. It's not just made the best person win. Unfortunately, in American politics, a lot of times, um, women need that extra support to be asked to run, to get to be, to find, get finance and to get, to get validation, um, from their party out, out, uh, in the marketplace, basically. That's a, that is a great answer. Um, and if I have time, Betsy, do I have time to ask another question? Yeah, sure. Okay, that is great. So if I can turn back to the Congresswoman. So Jen's book is all about um, the campaigns of women running in 2018 and then what it's like to be there. I'm just curious, what is your perspective on how the women elected in 2018 are changing Congress for the better or for the worse? I think it's for the better, but... And oh, I'm sorry. And well, let me just say, sorry, that is um, Hadley Vanderbosch's question. Yes. Oh, uh, thank you, Hadley. Um, you know, I think in in one very, very simple way, right? So when when kids come to visit the Capitol and they go into the gallery and they look down and they see me and they see Lauren Underwood and they see Mikey Sherrill and they see Ayanna Presley and they see Sharice Davids and they see Alexandria, like they see people that they could be. And I think it's as, as as simple as that. Yes, we have voices and yes, we're working on great legislation. And yes, we're you know focused on all of these really important things from a legislative perspective. But the real impact, I think, is going to be generational in the fact that in my community, you know, I'm very aware of the fact that there are times when I know I am being used as a teachable moment when there are parents of young girls who will say, oh, this is your congressperson, right? And like the message to that child is like, she's she's just like you, she's an, like, she's a woman. You could grow up to be like this. Um, and I think that that is honestly, I hope actually the biggest impact because you know I'm proud of the legislative achievements that I've had just in my first year and, and some months. Uh, we've been very, very powerful, but you know, when you think about the fact that I'm, I'm looking in my books and I see this woman right here, right? We've got Madeleine Albright. There's one Madeleine Albright. But the fact that in our generation, there's a whole bunch of us, you know, the fact that people confuse me with Mikey Sherrill, we don't really look anything alike because there's like just enough, you know, uh, women about the same age eh, that like people just confuse us. That's actually really good um, from the fact that there's, there's a little bit of something for everybody. And our role isn't just for that one special woman who can rise. It is ideally just as attainable for women um, as it has always been for men. So Congresswoman, um, that was great. I, we have a couple of questions um, from the audience and I would encourage folks uh, to please continue to submit them. Um, Paloma Perez asks um, a great question. She says, oftentimes women leaders are unduly scrutinized for personal life decisions. For example, the way First Lady Michelle Obama felt she had to even think twice about her outfit choices. Uh, what advice do you have for young women who want to run for office, who are afraid that their past may be used against them, but have a genuine desire to serve the community? And she also adds that she knocked doors for you in Orange, Pennsylvania. Oh, in Thank you, Paloma. Um, Paloma is one of my favorite names. And if my last name were in Spanberger, one of my daughters would probably be a Paloma. But um, thank you for that question. I, I, I would say there's a couple things here. One, you have to be fearless. They are going to use everything. People who want to knock you down will use everything they possibly can use to knock you down. Uh, if anybody saw the attack ads against me in 2018, they said I was a terrorist, right? Like former CIA officer, I worked terrorism cases. I I fought terrorism and here they're positioning me as a terrorist. So a, anything they can and say about you, they will um, potentially, right? Like that's always gonna be there. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, as it relates to young women's choices, you know, I, I do have a little bit, you know, I, I've had multiple security clearances. I was a CIA officer. I always knew I wanted to be a CIA officer. So I'm a little bit of the, the um, my, multiple background checks. Like I felt confident there wasn't going to be something that could get taken or misconstrued um, necessarily. But, you know, I think it's about being who you are and owning who you are. Um, and that's not to say that it's without risk. It's not to say that it's 
not without real challenges. And, and we've seen that with candidates in the past where you know things have been brought up and used against them. Um, but it shouldn't stop you. Um, and I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really as, as simple as that, Paloma, that, um, you know, yes, we get judged for how we're dressed. And I was really thankful that Jennifer made the comment about the, you know, the haircutting in the middle of the pandemic, you know, and so yes, do I, am I as fast to get ready for, you know, a, a day at the Capitol when there's cameras places when I'm, you know, trying to contend with my frizzy, but it's, that is really what it is to be a professional woman, right? Like, the judgment is, do you look professional? Are you being professional? Um, and I think that you get to define what that is. Um, and certainly I am you know, not among the most stylish of the, the Congresswoman. Um, and you'll see that there are uh, some of my colleagues are really sort of redefining what is professional um, in, a, in a really classy, authentic, cool way for them. Um, and, and so, you know, there's always going to be, in, in, unfortunately, in the world of politics, there's always going to be something that will be said about you that isn't true or something that will, you know, be meant to take you down. And if you're really focused on who you are and, frankly, why you're doing it, then some of it doesn't matter. And in my district, like I, I guess to the same point with wanting to know, know the COVID-19 stories, like there are stories of people whose lives are really challenging. Um, and they're the stories that I carry with me. And on a day when, you know, I'm getting hit for this and I read some article where I, they totally misconstrued something and I'm feeling, you know, upset about it. I think, you know what, like this is, this is the, this is the price I am willing to pay because that person needs someone who cares deeply about them. Like those are, those are the type of this person, this person, like, and I literally have their names in my head, constituents who I met along the campaign trail who, who keep me motivated. Um, and so I think you have to find that center of why you're doing it and who you're doing it for um, and try as much as you can to just let it go like like water off a duck's back. Um, but you get to define what is a strong um, professional woman uh, in whatever career you choose, regardless of whether it's politics or something else. That's great. Um, I want to bring Jennifer in. It says this is a great question um, for the two of you all to uh, weigh in on. Uh, Whitney Johnson is asking, um, first of all, Congresswoman, about what kind of legacy you want to leave uh, on Capitol Hill, but also about what leadership characteristics are most important to you. And I guess maybe if we could start with Jen and then go to the Congresswoman. Jen, as you've done the you know interviews and uh, research for your book, what are those leadership characteristics that you've seen in um, some of the most successful women uh, on the Hill? Well, it was interesting just listening to the Congresswoman talk about um, being yourself. And I think that one thing we've all seen, for better and worse, frankly, is that Americans really kind of crave authenticity from their leaders. And I think if you uh, can own who you are and, and um, feel comfortable in your skin, whether that's about what you wear to work or how you present on TV or the fact that you're a little snarky or you're a little funny or you're a little sarcastic or you're a little shy. If people understand that to be your authentic self, I think that becomes a leadership quality because people understand that um, that what you're talking about and how you're relating to them, um, it's working for them. They feel led by you. Yeah, even if you're not kind of, and, and, not in spite of, but because you're not kind of buying into sort of this cookie cutter vision of what we used to think of as politicians and women in politics. Um, I think that, um, you know, there was a real, I think we learned a lot in this uh, Congress that there's a huge difference between having political power uh, in your party and having legislative power on the Hill. Um, and that's a choice, but to be a leader, you, it, to be a true leader in Congress, you have to embrace and um, and promulgate the latter. You have to build coalitions. Um, and if you're if you're uh, kind of poking your colleagues politically from the outside, it's very difficult to do that. You have to build coalitions. You have to put your head down and get really smart uh, about legislation and the process and understand the bizarre ways that Congress works and kind of do the stuff that's boring and unsexy and doesn't give up, get on television. And we reporters kind of see that from behind the scene. Those are people. Um, who who are building on leadership, I think, and who are becoming who are becoming the future. And Congressman, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? And and um, the second part of that question is, uh, what kind of legacy you want us to leave on the Hill? 
Wow. Uh, so I agree with Jennifer completely. You know, I, I think there's there's different roles that we can all play or choose to play. And and for me, my focus is, you know, when you so the president won my district by almost seven points. I'm the first Democrat elected in 50 years. When I got elected in 2018, I had two years. Right. Like some people you get elected and and, you know, you can be there as long as you want to be there. For me, it's it's two years to deliver on the things that I think are important. Um, and then, you know, ideally I will earn two more and two more and two more and every two years it'll be the same thing. And so for me, leadership is being trustworthy by your colleagues, uh, being, tr being trusted because you are trustworthy, um, uh, working to really understand differences of opinion and, and trying to solve problems. You know, there's, I, coming from the national security diplomacy background, there is no such thing as a, a, a diplomatic agreement where everybody's 100% happy. And when you represent a district like mine, there, are, no matter what I say, there are there's always a lot of people in the room who are unhappy and a lot of people who are happy and a lot of people are eh, in the middle. Um, and my mandate from my district is to always be true to the things I believe, but to ensure that I am talking um, in a way where I am talking about an issue um, in language that is accessible to everyone. Um, and, and so helping translate issues, um, talking about things. Why do, I, why do I care so deeply about healthcare? Well, it extends a lot beyond the notion that healthcare is or isn't a human right. Like that's a binary thing that, that, that doesn't drive legislation. You know, if, if someone feels that way, then, then great, then they're probably inclined to work to strengthen our healthcare system. But what if they don't feel that way? They don't feel that it is a human right. Then do I make it an economic argument? Do I talk about how it's a societal issue? Do I talk about how it's a national security issue that you know, estimates are 70% of those who would uh, who take the entrance exam for the military are not eligible because of health problems or because they can't pass the entrance exam, right? Like whatever gets you motivated to care about the issue I care about, I'm going to try and find it. Um, and that to Jennifer's point, like that's kind of wonky and that's not super exciting. And, you know, I'm wandering around with my backpack on, um, but that's what I love. And that's honestly how I serve my district because um, in my district where I have uh, a lot of agricultural communities and I've got small businesses and I've got, you know, government workers, I've got everything, being able to go to a cattleman and talk about the real issues and challenges that he or she is facing on their cattle farm. And then you know, 20 minutes later, be in a small restaurant that's, you know, fusion this that they're trying in some kind of cutesy area of the suburbs, like, it, it, it's really different. And how do I focus on the issues related to, you know, trucking cattle? I was talking to my husband yesterday, and I said, yeah, I mean, with all the truck stops closed, it's become really difficult, difficult for our, you know, long haul truckers, particularly those who are hauling like livestock and I'm on this little bit of a rant and he just looks at me and says, are you listening to yourself? You know, as, and I, I live in the suburbs, I have no background in, in, in agriculture, but like letting these things and these needs permeate your thoughts, I think um, is how you can bring ideas and people and the focus of so many different communities together. And, you know, that's, that's what I think is exciting about the ability to demonstrate kind of leadership, which is, being trustworthy and um, and leading people, bringing people together. And so I, I guess a legacy that I would wanna have on the Hill is, um, I hope that at some point in the future, you know, it it isn't, I, I, I love all of the, you know, I, I love your focus, Jennifer, but I would love for us to get to a point where it isn't really interesting that there's a, a bunch of women in Congress, right? Like um, I'd love part of my legacy to be part of this group of women that just helped continue to break this dam, which to be very clear, many women before us, onesie, twosie came through it. We're just the ones who've come through in large mass. I hope that once we break this barrier, it never goes back up. Um, and if I had to really define what I would want to be my legacy, I would want it to be that people thought I was kind and hardworking and that I brought that to Congress um, because I think that's, that's how I achieve something. And that's the legislator that I want to be. Um, and yeah. I think we're, we're all hoping, I mean, running the Institute of Women in Politics, we all hope that, you know, we're unemployed one day in that sense that the, <laughs> we don't need to have an institute on women in politics, right? That's right. Our mission is to close that gender gap. And 
Um, maybe one day we'll get there. Um, let's see, we have another question. Uh, Tarina um, is asking, what is your advice to prospective public servants who are trying to learn how to balance personal morals and ethics and values with the often chaotic and sometimes corrupt world of politics? Be unflappable and focused. Um, and I think when there's issues that, um, if you have a sense about you of what is right and what is wrong, don't, don't, don't fall for any sort of slippery slope. Um, if you think something is incorrect, it's incorrect. There's no justification um, on issues of ethics we have a crisis in this country where voters just don't think that they can trust politicians they or politicians. Um, and, and notably, when I was running, people would say, oh, are you going to take money from this company or this company? You know, in Virginia, we have unlimited campaign finance laws for the for the state offices. So, you know, companies can write uh, dollars kind of right off the top. At the federal level, we can only take money from corporate PACs, et cetera, et cetera. But what was really striking to me is Nobody was really concerned about this particular company or that company, but it it spoke to this broader concern that they just thought that, you know, at the federal level, at least, I don't know what the limits are for corporate PACs because I don't take corporate PAC money, but, you know, a couple thousand dollars is going to influence you decisively, which, you know, as a former CIA officer, I used to strap tens of thousands of dollars to my waist, <laughs> head out on the street, get someplace, hand it over cash to some person who does like a scribbly line then I come back to my office and say like, oh yeah, I gave the $30,000 to that guy. Yeah, here's your receipt, a little squiggle line. So like for me, the notion that you could be corrupted by you know, a, a couple you know, thousand dollars in campaign contribu contributions was, was really kind of silly to me, except what I heard in all those people who would ask this question, it, it was the fact that if they believed it, that's what mattered, right? And so I think that the job of any elected official, particularly today's day and age, is to demonstrate a trustworthiness. And you may have to go above and beyond. And, um, or, or you have to recognize, like I, I do not believe that a, you know, a couple thousand dollar campaign contribution really changes my behavior. But if my potential voters might think it does, then that matters to me. And so I chose not to take corporate PAC dollars because I, I wanted to remove that from the conversation. Because if there's a place where I can say, I want to demonstrate a trustworthiness, and this is a way that I can convey that to you, then I'm, I'm going to do it because I think it's incredibly important. Um, and it, you know, there's a whole host of things where if you're out campaigning and if you're running for office, you can see places where people think that you're no longer one of them or they think that you're distant. And so for me, you know, outside of the COVID-19 issues, it's really important for me to have town halls. I love them. I love standing in front of people. I actually really like it when people get feisty and argue with me um, because I like what is essentially the opportunity for me to demonstrate respect. When someone is haranguing me about some issue and some, you know, people who disagree with that person but agree with me kind of start haranguing them back for me to be able to say, no, let, let him speak. Like, we disagree, but I am his representative. I want to hear his opinion and I want to answer his question. Like there are places where you get to demonstrate um, a respect for the system, a respect for the office, um, a respect for differing opinions. And, and I think there's a real significance in having the opportunity to restore in whatever bits and pieces you can, a little bit of faith that people have in the system. Uh, because politics is so incredibly important and we need um, public servants who are focused on being in elected office as public servants and not as elected officials or not as, you know, whatever sort of honorary title they give you. And honestly, if politics becomes so negative that good people don't run, then we don't have good people in politics. And so, you know, it's, it's constantly a process. And, you know, I think that's one of the th fun things about our classes. There's so many people who, you know, never considered running before. So they have, this was the first time that they jumped into this kind of mess of politics. And there's a lot of parents with young kids. And if anything keeps you real in this world, it's having um, a, <laughs> a third grader <laughs> tell you the real truth about 
anything. Um, and so I, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's about being the type of elected official that you want to see in the system. And, and as a voter, express, express, expecting a certain level of accountability that's super important. Well, Congresswoman, I think that's the perfect leadership lessons uh, to end on. And um, I'm going to be respectful of all of your time. And uh, we are just about five minutes over. So um, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Susanna and Running Start uh, for everything you all did. Um, thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you, Jennifer, for this terrific book. Yeah. Um, that everyone should read. Uh, please get a copy of it. Uh, perfect reading while you're stuck at home. <laughs> um, and uh, don't forget, you can do a, watch a replay of this event uh, at the same link. And we hope you'll do that. And um, please stay in touch with us and um, check out future events that we have uh, coming up. So thank you, everyone. And have a uh, nice night and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, Betsy. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye. <laughs>